You can do better than that. Give it up for Eric. Josh and for Abby for speaking their truth and for their family and for their ministry to us. I want to let you know I could have asked so many other people other than Josh and other than Abby to give testimonials this morning. Um, I just sort of put a bunch of people on a list and picked two, and they were the first two people I asked, and were also the first two people who said yes. And I'm so grateful for their reflections, and I didn't even really know what they were going to say. When, when I, I knew a little bit of what Josh was going to say, but, but I didn't know. So some of this, some of my sermon diverges, and some of it um, reinforces. But there's so many others that I could have asked. I'm probably going to embarrass some people here. I could have asked Brian Pence to talk about his public health research centered on the intersection of HIV AIDS and mental health in Malawi. I could have asked Carolyn Holt to talk about her incredible work with seniors, empowering them to consider end of life issues. I could have asked Paul Mitchell to talk about his work as an ESL tutor with the Latino population. I could have asked Jenny Warnash, I embarrassed her at the first service, to talk about her leadership as a sexuality and health educator through our church's Our Whole Lives program. Now that is ministry. Larry, you know it's coming. I could have asked Larry Ross to reprise his role on the video talking about the Meals on Wheels program and his delivery route. Who saw that video of Larry? That's cool. I could go on and on and on talking about the amazing and inspiring ministries, ministries of so many in our church. Or I could open up the floor and invite those of you who I do not know as well to share your stories. And those stories would certainly amaze and astound. Ministry, it's a funny word. In the United States, at least, the term minister is used almost exclusively to refer to the ordained professional within a Protestant congregation. Moi. <laughs> we qualify it when that's not what we mean. We talk about, for example, the hospice chaplain as a community minister, qualified. We talk about members of our caring ministry as lay ministers, qualified. And I think that linguistic, how we use that is unfortunate. I think it's unfortunate that the term is not understood more broadly, or understood we have need of qualification more broadly. Outside of the United States, minister often has another meaning. Often the heads of various government agencies are referred to as ministers. You have foreign ministers, a minister of education, a minister of health, a minister of culture, a minister of defense. I wonder how it might change if we use that terminology. The word ministry, by the way, comes from the Latin, and to minister means to serve to attend to. And while sometimes getting so caught up on definitions can hinder more than help, allow me to humbly offer you this definition of ministry. Ministry simply is service undertaken in pursuit of a humanistic value or universal purpose. It is about the meaning of service and also about the vision that underlies that service. Just as from Abby's grandfather, Abby's grandfather had this vision of a world in which no one thought that there wasn't somebody looking for them. I want to suggest an expansive definition of ministry. Ministry, and by the way, ministry has been, that definition has been expanding throughout kind of the history of religion. Martin Luther 
imagine a priesthood of all believers. James Luther Adams imagined a prophethood of all believers. And I'm a firm believer in a ministry of all. Ministry, I believe, can be what you do professionally. And I don't just mean social workers, therapists, teachers, nurses, public defenders. Is a scientist working to develop an immunization for a dread disease doing a form of ministry? Sure. Is that musician, that musician who sings that song, that song that hits you right in your feelings, that song that you sing to yourself to help you get through what you're going through? Does that, if you receive that song as a ministry, is that musician a minister? Yep. Feels like a ministry. Yeah. I'm going to answer yes. I've got an amen choir behind you. Feels like ministry to me. Volunteering can be a kind of ministry. Activism can be a kind of ministry. Can care of family, care for a family member, be a kind of ministry? I would hate to be the one to say it isn't. I think back to that moment when I first had a more expansive idea of ministry. It was an article that I read in the Unitarian Universalist World magazine. The story was about a group who called themselves the Faithful Fools. They were founded by a Unitarian Universalist minister and a Catholic nun together. And the Faithful Fools were a street ministry in San Francisco that primarily served people who lived on the streets. The ministry, if I remember correctly, combined direct services to people on the streets, as well as community organizing around changing policies that had a, a negative impact on the homeless. But the, what overlined this ministry, what, 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 what contained it, was their general befriending work, their work of recognizing the dignity and the humanity of homeless folks in San Francisco. Their thing was that the faithful fools dressed as clowns when they did this work. Bright vests, baggy pants, festive hats, red noses. I'm not sure why. <laughs> my, hunch, my hunch is that the goal was to counteract the professional distance that some service providers keep. Or maybe it's to point out the sheer absurdity of a world in which excessive wealth lives side by side with poverty, where overflowing kitchens exist side by side with hunger. But what I took from that article, one of the things that I took from that story, was that somebody, even somebody dressed as a clown, with a red clown nose, can be doing ministry. Why not? Why try to narrow the definition to what ministry can be? And church, of course, can be a place where we find our ministry through teaching religious education, leading a covenant group, joining the caring ministry, volunteering with IFC, being a part of the preaching practicum class, setting up tables and setting up refreshments at a memorial service. That's ministry. Starting a cancer support group, mentoring a youth in the coming of age program, Staying overnight with Rosa at the Church of the Reconciliation. Witnessing at the legislative building in Raleigh, and so on, and so on, and so on. How many of us, I wonder, have found our ministry, or a ministry, through being a part of this community? It also needs to be pointed out that there are times, I think for any of us, when we find, when we seem to think that what we're doing isn't ministry. We go through, we wrestle, we go through fallow times. Even Mother Teresa wrote a book, Wrestling with Her Faith, and wrestling with her sense of whether her ministry was making it. Mother Teresa, what hope is there for us? <laughs> I think it's important to honor that wrestling, to honor those fallow times. I sometimes wonder whether the problem for those of us 
who think of us, who think of ourselves as being without a ministry, I wonder if the problem lies in defining ministry too narrowly. Oh, I, I don't have a ministry unless I'm living on the streets of Calcutta. Oh, I don't, I don't have a ministry unless I'm, you know, getting, getting nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Perhaps you do have one, and you need to change your perception and see it as such. I'm going to end this morning with two parts. The first part is invitation. The second part is inspiration. So I'll give you the invitation first. First, the invitation. In eight weeks, minus a day, that would be Saturday, March 2nd, we are going to have our first ever community church day of service. The goal is for those in our church community to, on that one single day, to perform 1,000 hours of community service to the wider community and wider world. The service will be done, hopefully, as parts of groups. We'll be meeting here at the church and sending out teams to do service projects, to build a habitat house, to do a project for El Centro, to clean up a stream, and so on and so forth. Other teams will take, take, undertake projects that can be, be completed on site here, writing cards to those held in immigration detention centers, creating bags to give out to the homeless, knitting shawls for hospice. This day of service will run concurrently with the annual pledge drive. Did you get that? That means the annual pledge drive is going to last one day this year. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the inspiration. The idea, the idea is that you will make your pledge for the coming church year. When you do that, you'll do so with kind of an awareness of the power of this church community and the difference this church community makes. So the first ask, I want you to take out your phone or your calendar or a scrap of paper. If you haven't already done something, put March 2nd day of service on it. I want you to book yourself for that day. It's not the day of the UNC Duke game, by the way. <laughs> Just saying. And the second ask is that the co-chairs of our day of service and annual pledge drive are sitting there in the back today. Mary Beth Powell and Bill Rote. You're still going to be the co-chairs after today, after this morning? All right, you're still in there. All right, good. I would love... They would love for you to consider sponsoring a project, a group project that day. Maybe, maybe I don't know, your apartment backs up to a stream that needs to be cleaned, and you think, I could host 15 people, and we could knock that thing out. We could make that beautiful. <coughs> maybe you're connected with an amazing nonprofit that could use 10 people to come short donations. Maybe you have a neighbor who you're kind of concerned about, that neighbor needs a new coat of paint on their garage. I don't know. But I'll tell you that, that Bill and Mary Beth would love your generous offer to host a group of, of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 people that day to do a project. All right? All right? That's the invitation. I want to leave you with the, with the inspiration. I want to read a meditation that I love. It's written by my wonderful colleague, Vanessa Rush Southern, who serves our church in San Francisco now. And it's a story I think about ministry. It goes like this. For years, when I was little, I'm in Vanessa's voice right now. For years, when I was little, I begged for a dog. One day, I came home to find an Australian shepherd that my dad had rescued from the pound. Lady, as I called her, was probably two years old when we got her. She was small for her breed, small and meek. She did not even bark for the first six months we had her. Although she was a shepherd by breed, Lady was a city dog, whose daily routines involved walking around the block and not much else. The poor thing, poor thing was bred for life, for a life of work in the fields, but she hadn't even seen a sheep in her life, and never would. 
But one year, my family made a decision to move, and the city to which we were moving was not at all hospitable to dogs. It became clear that we would have to find Lady a new home. We decided to take her to my grandfather's farm in New Mexico. My grandfather, who had taken up the hobby of raising racehorses and had 15 acres of land. It was here that we took Lady, our meek city dog, for her waning years. The first morning after our arrival at the farm, we awoke to find no sign of her. She didn't come when, when we called. To add to our worries, my grandfather noticed that the horses were nowhere to be seen either. <laughs> as quickly as we could, we dressed and set out, look, set out looking for the missing dog and horses. We looked to one side of the field with no luck, no animals over there. Then we looked to the other side of the fields and seemed to have no luck again until in the farthest corner of the farthest field we saw something. At first it looked just like one or two of the horses, but as we got closer we saw it was all five. Clearly agitated and restless at being corralled in one small corner of the field. <laughs> Only when we got to within 20 feet could we see what kept them there. <laughs> there, near to the ground, just below their ears, running back and forth, barking and nipping at their heels, was Lady, her bobbed tail wagging in pure delight. <laughs> After all those years, Lady had found her calling. <laughs> it was instinct and pure joy to her. I wonder how likely it is that you or I could be born to a calling born with the gift, born to a ministry and not know it, maybe never know it? Could we also go all or most of a lifetime without figuring such a thing out? I hope that, even late in our lives, when we experience that passion, whatever it is, that we know it. We know it as the thing for which we were made.